Well, good evening, everyone. Welcome to our NPC Online Bible Study. My name is Matthew McGlade. I'm the lead and teaching pastor here at Mansfield Pentecostal Church, where every Tuesday night we have our thought to think about, a question to ponder, our text to study uh, as part of our Bible study. And as I say this most weeks, uh, this is a great way for you to learn, uh, particularly in a small group. If you're not in a life group, uh, grab two or three other people uh, who you uh, get along with, meet up, uh, listen, watch the study, uh, and ask the questions and discuss the questions afterwards. And as I say most times, that way you get a lot more out of our time together than you just listening to me on your own. I don't. Want, I also just want to give a, a, a word of thanks uh, to Sandra uh, last week for uh, doing the study. It was fantastic, and the week before, obviously, uh, my dad uh, did did the study as well. Uh, so guys, thank you very much for stepping in. It just gave me a couple of weeks to have a, a little break, which was much appreciated. Now, you will remember that uh, a few weeks ago, and for a number of weeks, I've been uh, doing a Bible study series titled The Hope of the World. And we're looking at the doctrine, the teaching of the church. And we've seen that the church is, I believe, the hope of the world because it is the only agency on earth which continues the work of Jesus Christ here on earth after he ascended into heaven. Uh, one of the very first studies we looked at, we looked at various metaphors of the church, we looked at the purpose of the church, uh, we've looked at the purity of the church, <coughs> the unity of the church, and then recently we've been looking at the church's authority, it's particularly its realm of authority, which is in the spiritual realm, the relationship between the church and the state, and also the importance of the church exercising discipline. Uh, it has to uh, have discipline within itself, otherwise uh, the church no longer becomes effective. It loses its, its distinctiveness in bringing the gospel of Christ into this broken world. Now what I want to do over these next uh, few weeks, we're going to obviously continue on this theme on the hope of the world. And what I want to look at is one particular aspect of the church, which is the governance of the church. How should the church be governed? And uh, over these next few weeks, I'm going to be looking at various leadership roles in the church, different styles of government. And we're going to be just addressing a number of issues around that. Uh, but, but without neglecting uh, the role of the prophet, uh, which plays a key role in the church, and the evangelist, I want to focus specifically over these next few weeks in particular, over three particular roles in the church. That of an apostle, that of a pastor teacher. Uh, sometimes the roles of pastor and teacher are seen as separate. Sometimes they're seen as combined in one. But we'll look at the pastor teacher, the apostle pastor teacher, and also that of a deacon or a servant leader. And uh, although it's important to understand that, yes, uh, according to Paul in Ephesians 4.11, that the, gift, the five gift ministries of apostle, prophet, uh, pastor, teacher, evangelist is to equip God's people for works of service. They also play an important role in guarding the church, protecting the flock, uh, as well as bringing uh, direction. Now tonight, what I want us to look at as we address this issue of how should the church be governed, I want to ask this really important question, are apostles for today? Are apostles for today? And in answering this question, I want to give both a unique answer or a specific answer and a generic or general answer. So in answering the, this question, the first thing that to say is that there are no apostles today, okay? There are no apostles today. And that is when I use the word apostle in its unique sense. Now, when we think of the apostles of the New Testament, we think of the 12 apostles that Jesus appointed, and they were unique. Uh, many of those apostles, like uh, Peter, like Matthew, uh, like John, they wrote large parts of our, of our New Testament that, that we read. Uh, and they had certain qualifications that, uh, that appointed them as apostles in a unique sense. And I want to just touch on a couple of those qualifications. The first qualification is that they were uniquely commissioned by Christ into the role of an apostle. Luke mentions in his gospel, he says that on one of those days, Jesus went out on a mountainside to pray <coughs> and spent the night praying to God. And when morning came, he called his disciples to him and chose 12 of them, 
whom he designated apostles. Now we actually know that Jesus actually had more than 12 disciples. In fact, in Luke's gospel, he had quite a number of disciples. He had about 72 of them. But of those disciples, 12 of them, Luke says, he designated as apostles. Now the word apostle, apostolus, literally means to be sent, as sent ones. Uh, and, and again, Luke emphasizes the importance of this choosing, of this designating of Jesus. Uh, even the beginning of Acts, um, when Jesus appeared to the apostles and he taught them through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. And yet we are aware, aren't we, that of the 12 apostles whom Jesus had chosen, one of them, Judas, uh, betrayed Jesus. Judas uh, betrayed Jesus. He walked away from him. He Actually, if we, if we look at uh, the Gospels, he committed, at the end of his life, he committed a suicide. And so it was felt important amongst the apostles after Judas's death and after Jesus' resurrection that someone should be appointed uh, to, to replace him. And so for them, it was important in their mind that there, was this, a ha there had to be 12 apostles. There had to be the specific number. And if someone uh, had fallen from those 12, someone had to be appointed to replace them. And so uh, the remaining apostles, they prayed and they sought God who should replace Judas. And uh, Luke records uh, that they prayed this prayer. They prayed, show us which of these two, Justice or Matthias, you have chosen to take over the apostolic ministry which Judas left to go where he belongs. And so they prayed, they cast lots, and, uh, and uh, Matthias was chosen to replace Ju Judas. And so the apostles, the 12 uh, new, uh, original apostles, they're unique in the sense that they were appointed. They're also unique in another sense that they had to have testified, had to have seen the resurrection of Jesus. Not only that, they had to know Jesus before his death. Uh, they had to know him from uh, his time, his ministry in Galilee. They had to have witnessed his death and they also had to have witnessed his resurrection. They were first-hand eyewitnesses of all these accounts. And so Jesus appeared after his resurrection to his original 12 or 11 at that time and uh, apostles and he gave them many convincing proofs that he was alive but it wasn't just the 11 it was also his close followers as well and so given this an important requirement uh, for someone to replace Judas was was that they ha had to have known Jesus from the beginning of John's baptism to the time when Jesus was taken up from us for one of these uh, for one of these must become a witness with us of his resurrection. And that was one of the qualifications, the second qualification that Peter felt was important uh, for someone to be an apostle. And so given this unique description of what an apostle is, I think it would be fair for us to say that there are no apostles today in the church. There were just 12 whom Luke mentions by name who are Simon, whom he, whom he named Peter, his brother Andrew, James, John, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas, James, son of Alphaeus, Simon, who was called the Zealot, Judas, the son of James, and Judas Iscariot, who became a traitor. And as we mentioned uh, earlier on, uh, it was later deemed important that Matthias should replace Judas as an apostle. And so there were only 12 apostles, unique in their role and their description, unique in their qualifications to be apostles. And again, the importance of this number of only 12 is reflected even in the last book of, of, uh, of the Bible, the book of Revelation, uh, when John describing the New Jerusalem says that the wall of the city had 12 foundations and on them were the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. And so in my view, Jesus appointed 12 apostles as a shadow of the 12 tribes of Israel. Because if you think about it, the 12 tribes of Israel were named after the founding fathers of the 12 tribes of Israel, of the nation that 
descended from Israel, from Jacob. And in the same way, Jesus is making a statement. I'm appointing 12 apostles because they are going to be the 12 founding fathers of a new people, of a new nation, uh, of those who have come into the kingdom of God. And so in a unique sense, there are no apostles today. There are only 12. However, I want to just go a little bit further than that, because in another sense, in a more generic or general sense, there are apostles today. Now, though um, Paul himself describes as someone who was appointed as an apostle by the Lord, although he says he was a witness of the resurrection of, of Jesus, he had actually seen the risen Lord, although Paul himself jealously guards the title of himself being an apostle, he still sees himself as one who was abnormally born. And that he himself said, I don't even deserve to be called an apostle because he persecuted the church. And so in the light of Paul's experience, we have the start of an understanding of an apostle that in my view may be more generic or functional in its use. You see, along with Paul, throughout the New Testament, and particularly in the book of Acts, we have a growing list of the names of people who are also described as apostles in addition to the original 12. Luke mentions in, the, in Acts 13 that while they, that's the leaders in the church of Antioch, were worshipping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul, for the work that I have called them. And so, they've had, and so they had fasted and prayed. And they placed their hands on them and sent them off. And so Paul and Barnabas went on their first uh, missionary journey, journey. I think they went to uh, Crete or Cyprus initially. Uh, and then went into to, uh, Asia Minor or, or Turkey. And Luke later describes them as the apostles Barnabas and Paul. And so in addition to the 12, we have Paul, and now we even have Barnabas as apostle. Uh, along with this, uh, Paul makes reference to Jesus' natural brother James as an apostle. Uh, when he says, I saw none of the other apostles, only James, the Lord's brother, whom he later describes as a pillar in the church of Jerusalem. On a second missionary journey, uh, Paul partnered with a man by the name of Silas uh, as they were going into uh, Philippi and, and, and parts of, of uh, Macedonia and, and Acacia, part of modern Greece. And uh, Paul travelled with him as an apostle and Paul included him and labelled him as an apostle when he was writing to the Thessalonians. And when writing to the Romans, uh, Paul mentions... Greet Adronicus and Junia, my fellow Jews who have been in prison with me. They are outstanding among the apostles and they were in Christ before I was. And so we see that beyond the original 12, we actually have a growing number of people who are described as apostles who played a foundational role in, in building churches and setting up churches, who a, were obviously played a key role in equipping people for ministry. But in the broader sense, as I mentioned earlier on, an apostle means someone who is sent. In the broader sense of the meaning of the word, an apostle is effectively a missionary. And so someone who is sent and the characteristics of the apostle that we see uh, throughout Acts and, and throughout uh, many of Paul's letters is that they pioneered new works, they planted churches, uh, signs and wonders would normally follow them. And I would say that though, though, though there are no apostles today in the unique sense of the word, I think in its more general use, I would say that the ministry of, of, of apostleship I believe is still actually a very important and key ministry even today in the church. We have missionaries 
we have church planters, we have uh, pioneers who bring the gospel of Christ to new places, to new domains. Uh, they start new churches, they do new works, they break into new, 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 new spheres where there is a need for uh, the work of God to be established, particularly, in, I think, in, particularly in church planting. And so we also have, you know, in, in the New Testament in particularly, we have examples of apostolic teams. So an apostolic team is led by an apostolic leader. Paul was an apostolic leader, but around him he had teams of people. He had Luke, uh, his doctor, as his com traveling companion, he had Titus, he had Timothy, uh, he had Epaphroditus. He had these different guys on his team. And, uh, you know, Paul would go planting churches. And then sometimes when he hear, would hear there was a problem in the church that he planted, he would send either Titus or Epaphroditus or Timothy to these places to troubleshoot, to deal with issues as and when they went. And they went with apostolic authority to deal with those issues. Uh, so he, even when Paul is describing uh, Epaphroditus, he says, I think it necessary to send or apostolos Back to Epaphroditus, my, my brother, co-worker, fellow soldier, who is also your messenger, whom you sent to take care of my needs. And so, um, and so Paul felt it was necessary to send these guys on his team to help churches that he had already established. Of Titus, Paul says, as for you, Titus, uh, as for Titus, sorry, he is my partner and fellow worker among you. As for our brothers, they are representatives of the churches and they are an honour to Christ. And so we see the importance that actually this ministry of apostleship uh, is there in the New Testament beyond the original 12. And I actually think it is a ministry that continues today. You know, there are still people groups uh, that have not heard the gospel of Christ. And, uh, you know, we still need missionaries. We still need church planters uh, to go into these places. And, uh, and God can raise up, I believe, uh, people with a, a clear, strong apostolic anointing uh, to pioneer new movements of churches in, in different parts of the world, or new ministries in different parts of the world. And so as we kind of close this session, uh, tonight and I thank you guys for for listening to all this. It is my personal belief that there are no apostles today <laughs> and that there are apostles today. So in the unique sense of the word there are no apostles today but in the generic functional sense of the word yes I do believe that apostles are uh, in the church today and they play an important role in the life of the church. Uh, so guys, thanks for listening tonight. I hope you got something out of that. I think that's just helpful for all of us here uh, to understand uh, the role of apostle. It's an important ministry in the life of the church. Just as the, uh, on the back of our thought to think about, I have a question or questions to ponder. And it's just a group of three questions I'd like to kind of ask you, maybe discuss these in your group. Uh, first question, do you think there is such a thing as apostles today? Do you think there is such a thing as apostles today, why or why not? What? How would you define a missionary? Okay, and that might be useful just to, on the back of that, do you think a missionary is the same as an apostle? Okay, I'll leave that to you to think about. And the last question is, in what sense are we all called to be missionaries? In what sense are we all called to be missionaries? That's a question to ponder. A text of study, I'd like you to read 2 Corinthians chapter 12, Verse, verse 11 to chapter 13 and verse 4. And as you uh, read that text, from Paul's words uh, to the Corinthians, what, mark, what marked him as a true apostle? There are true apostles, but there are also pseudo-apostles or false apostles. So what marked Paul as a true apostle? Guys, thanks for listening tonight. Hopefully you got something out of that. Hey, have a great rest of the week. Hope to see you uh, over the weekend. God bless you all. Bless you. See you soon.